welcome. Thanks for being here. And uh, we're excited to discuss all things Chief Wellness Officer related. I'm looking for my colleagues. Uh, here they are. Okay, I guess they're getting, getting some last minute notes. Getting mic'd up, okay. Sounds good. Well, why don't I take a minute to introduce them while they're getting mic'd up. Let's start with Jen Berliner. Uh, Dr. Berliner is the medical director of the Chief Medical and Scientific Office. And in that capacity, she serves of the, as the equivalent of the Chief Wellness Officer for the um, Pittsburgh Medical Center, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. She also serves on the scientific board for the Physician Wellness Academic Consortium and on the administrative board also for the Physician Wellness Academic Consortium. Welcome, Jen. Then Kirk Brower is, is here as well. And Kirk is the Chief Wellness Officer at the University of M Michigan Medical School. He also is the Faculty Director of the Wellness Office for, the, for Michigan Medicine. And he recently co-edited a book on physician mental health and well-being uh, research and practice. And Christine Olson's coming up, perfect timing, walking up the stairs as we announce her. And uh, Christine Olson is the Chief Wellness Officer at Yale New Haven Hospital. Uh, she's, on the, she's on the scientific board also for the Physician Wellness Academic Consortium. And in, in, in the past, she served on, uh, with the uh, American Medical Association Steering Committee for Joy in Medicine. And finally, Dr. John Ripp, who is the Chief Wellness Officer at the, I'm not sure if I say ICON correctly. ICON, yeah. ICON. ICON, ICON uh, School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And he is, has been invited to do all kinds of things in his career. He, he's participated in the uh, Accreditation Council on Graduate Medical Education Symposia on Physician Wellbeing, and uh, also has been asked to join the uh, American College of Physicians and Promoting Physician Wellbeing Task Force. So welcome. Thank you for doing this for all of us. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Murthy reminded us that it's a, it's a privilege to be a physician, and indeed it is. And in, in addition to being physicians, all of you have decided to answer a call to help your colleagues. And in that capacity, you're asked to wear many hats hats that might range everywhere from being a healer of healers, systems engineer, uh, change management expert, po population health expert, among other hats. How would you define the role of chief wellness officer? I'd love to hear from all of you on that. You want to start, John? Sure. Here. Um, and uh, first of all, thanks for having us here. Uh, it's really it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to join you this morning. Uh, and be able to speak about what, what we do and what we love to do. Uh, you know, Chief Wellness Officer, it's a, it's a pretty new position, uh, and um, we've had some uh, sessions already at the conference where we've talked about it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's in some ways kind of being defined, I think. I think, uh, you, you know, there have emerged a, a sort of um, set of, of roles and responsibilities that, that I think I'm curious to hear from my colleagues, uh, but you know, in many ways, we are uh, an institutional uh, leader, uh, appointed and recognized position within uh, an institution to, to have a role that has some degree of authority. Um, largely, there's, uh, or often there's, uh, or, or typically, a, an element that involves bringing some expertise that allows us to know how to measure, take the pulse of a given, uh, cohort, a constituency as it relates to their well-being, uh, and then sort of make some recommendations, consult, if you will, with, with stakeholders across uh, where often complex healthcare systems to, to, to know what to do with that information and to help drive change. Um, so with that, we often focus and, and lead by influence, um, not necessarily uh, leading uh, by having control per, per se over the large system drivers that are often um, what, what are behind the, 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 the 
uh, sort of direction that the, the ship, the, the kind of oil tanker that your health system is moving on, um, and, and those system drivers, the efficiencies and the culture of the place are what are, are, what are driving your system to, towards a direction of well-being. It's that chief wellness officer that's taking that pulse, understanding the data, making um, uh, sort of giving consultation about what to do with it and informing those large system, th those, those individuals that have control over the system on how to move. Uh, why don't I stop there? I think that's, that's a bit, but I'll pass it along. Christine. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd agree with what John said. Um, there's been a lot of change in the healthcare industry over the decades, and I think that knowing that context and where we are with health policy, the healthcare industry, uh, being able to model what it means to uh, work in these new paradigms to create a thriving work environment where people feel engaged and empowered like they belong and believe it's their own organization and then to be able to use that framework those models to create those assessments so that you can work with your policy makers your organizational stakeholders across the system your department sections your wellness directors um, make pathways for individuals to feel like they have um, power, control, input in their organization, that it's their own, that they, they belong and believe. Um, I think um, John put it very well in how we use those assessments to, to influence and work with um, other people around the organization. So I would agree, obviously. Thank you for having me. Um, what I would add is that I think the job of a chief wellness officer, or in my position, the director of uh, physician well-being, is to really align the goals of the organization with the goals of the physicians who are working there. So everyone essentially wants to make the workplace better and to make the health Organiza healthcare organization successful. And I think the chief wellness officer has the role of trying to um, get everyone on the same page, I would say, and, and make sure you're aligning everyone's goals because all of their goals are, this, are the same, although they're communicating them differently. So I think that that's an, a very important role of the chief wellness officer. And to react, both have a strategic plan for the long term, but also to react to the situations like we've seen in COVID-19 in the pandemic to try to help with the acute, change, acute needs and, and see the strategic plan for a long-term improvement. Th Hello, thank you. I'm honored to be here. And last night, Mickey and I had a conversation about uh, the Surgeon General's comment about the divisiveness in our country and what we could do about it. And I realized that um, our office does do something about that because it really doesn't matter what side you are on the political divide. And even with the politicization of vaccine mandates and mask mandates and all of that, what we all share in common is our emotional responses to this pandemic. We all feel a sense of loss. We all feel a sense of sadness. We all feel anger. We all, you know, because our lives have changed so much. And so when we connect with people on that emotional level, it can bring us together and I can speak to anyone because as a chief wellness officer, I'm responsible to everyone in our organization, regardless of their politics. Nice. I want to follow up on a couple of things that, that both of you said, Jen and, and Kirk. Jen, you've, you mentioned re, uh, pivoting, reacting quickly when something emerges like a worldwide pandemic. Uh, Kirk, you also talked about the correlated social unrest, the, d the division between us in, in addressing that. Prior to the pandemic, what did your goals and mission look like versus post-pandemic? What kind of changes have you seen? Well, our mission has always been to improve the workplace well-being of all faculty, staff, and learners at my institution, which is about 28,000 individuals. And we define workplace well-being as an optimal quality of life and experience when at work. And our goal was to have everyone, including our leaders at the institution, to adopt 
well-being as a core value in daily practice. So a core value, you know, is an idea and a practice is the action and you can't really have one without another. Um, after the pandemic, that changed slightly. It wasn't to adopt well-being, it was to prioritize well-being as a core value in daily practice and to get institutional leaders to see that because whatever our missions are, whether it be clinical care, research, education, or financially investing in our future, like, like building that new hospital, is only going to happen if the workforce is well and energized and motivated. Well said. So I'll talk a little bit more about the day-to-day -day changes. I think that, that those are overwhelming, um, great ideas and a, a good overview. Um, and the day-to-day, -day, I would say, prior to the pandemic, I was extremely focused on changing efficiency of practice, the culture of wellness at the organization. That was really my main focus, and I would say over and over, we want everyone to be more resilient. Personal resilience is important. And yet that's not what we're going to focus on here because that's not the role of the organization. And I would say during the pandemic, that completely changed. So we went back to the uh, Maslow's basic needs and tried to make sure people could get to the grocery store on time, tried to make sure they had places to stay if they didn't feel comfortable going home, tried to um, do a lot of personal resilience work. We held lots of town halls. We, um, and that's changed as the pandemic has changed. So I can give you an example. Most recently, we've had a town hall um, to try to teach people how to use motivational interviewing. Uh, so we've, uh, we've had our, our um, support of our psychiatry department so that they could separate themselves from the feelings they may have about the patients they're taking care of and the decisions they've made and maybe the um, disappointment of, of having burnout or being overworked because of other people's decisions and trying to teach them how to separate those um, feelings and be able to do their work. Mm -hmm. So I would say we focused a lot on personal resilience in a way that we, I never would have prioritized before. Sounds like personal resilience, but also management of anger in some cases towards patients. Trying to, yeah, trying to be able to separate those, those feelings, anger or disappointment or just, yeah. or just almost maybe even a blame that maybe we're in this position because everyone isn't doing their yeah. part. You know, Mickey, I would just amplify uh, those comments a little bit. I mean, I think, because what it makes me think about a little bit is what the chief wellness officer is, and, and in some ways, and per perhaps as important, if not more important, what the chief wellness officer is not. Um, and I think the pandemic highlighted that, you know, when there's a crisis that has the potential to impact the well-being of a large workforce, the chief wellness officer is going to be called and asked, you know, and what can you do about it? Uh, and and I, I think there's an appropriate role. We had an appropriate role. All of us did. All of us were in communication throughout the various waves of, of the crisis. So it was clear that we had a role. Uh, but I, I would say outside of the context of, of a pandemic, of a crisis, you know, we're, we're trying to be the ones that, that are able to describe the well-being of a given constituent group uh, provide that data to the people who can act on it uh, and elevate the priority of, of well-being, linking it to the data that we know it links to, which, which basically if you want to run a health system and have a high quality, you know, the, the quadruple aim, um, then, then, you know, well, the triple aim, adding well-being to make it the quadruple aim, then this is, this is important. That's outside the context of a crisis. Then a, a crisis comes along and, and we're being called, and I think to, to Dr. Berliner's point, you know, um, there was a shift towards the individual because uh, there was such concern that, that the individual worker uh, is under great, you know, con considerable stress. Uh, so there's, there's both, uh, it's sort of a blessing and a, and a curse in some ways, I would say. I'd be curious to know what my colleagues think. I think, um, you know, it, it elevated the importance of well-being, so our work perhaps was being, there was a spotlight shine on our work. Um, on the other hand, as we've been talking about at this conference, I think you know, we all hopefully are establishing that in order to really tackle this issue, we've got to tackle the system. And so now we kind of need to pivot back a little bit and revisit the importance of the efficiency of the workplace, of the culture of the workplace, 
and, uh, and, and maybe there's still a desire to focus uh, on the individual, uh, perhaps still somewhat. Um, it's, it's a dance, it's a balance, and, and the pandemic, I think, highlighted that. And Dr. Olson, I think, may have a comment too, but before I go to her, uh, John, I wonder if you might say just a little bit more about what this shift was like for you. I think all of us watched as New York was pummeled uh, yeah. early in the pandemic in a really terrifying way. What was that like, wearing your hat? Yeah, so um, I've, I've been speaking to a bunch of, of folks at the conference um, and kind of reflecting on those, those months, um, you know, last year. Uh, and in, in many ways, it was a blur uh, because there was such an intensity of work. Um, and, and, you know, I, I hesitate a little bit to describe it as unique in any way because we've all experienced this, this pandemic and the stress that it's brought. Um, and so I guess in many ways, it's, it's, we've all had our own kind of individual experiences based on how it had impacted where we were. Certainly in New York, I think one of the hallmarks is um, just how quickly things changed in March of last year. Uh, where I remember sitting with my team and, you know, as cases started to, to mount, or at least those early cases, we had, you know, we had a conversation, okay, why don't we take a look at what we're doing and maybe what's going to have to, some things will have to go on pause and some things will continue. And then within a matter of days, as, as, the, as the number of paces, patients were surging, we said, okay, we've got to pause everything and, and not, you know, we're going to have to stop what we're doing. And then a few days after that, it became clear wait a second, we have a central role to fill here as it relates to addressing the well-being of this workforce under, you know, under crisis where you know, the hospital was, was rapidly filling and, and the workforce was being redeployed and you know, there was all the uncertainty around, around this new virus. So um, you know, I think what some of the things Dr. Berliner said, you know, be, meeting basic daily needs was um, you know, an, an enormous challenge uh, that, that all of a sudden you know, society is turned upside down, you, and, you know, and, and personally, you know, having uh, young children who, you know, are now, they were of an age where we didn't have childcare, so now they're at home, and I'm at home, and we live in a New York City apartment, so it's not a huge space. Uh, so, you know, just, just an enormous number of stressors being thrown at us at once, and then we were just talking at breakfast, our, you know, our dean who had the foresight to see that this was, this was gonna have significant impact, we should study this. So I do remember getting called to him and, you know, in March, um, and many of you saw the beautiful presentation that Dr. Pecorallo gave yesterday uh, showcasing a lot of the data we collected. Um, but back in March of last year, the dean said, we need to study this, put a team together to research it, here's some money, make it happen. So in addition to kind of pivoting our, all of our offerings and dealing with a lot of personal stress, we you know, launched a big um, research initiative. So it was, uh, hence why it was a bit of a blur, um, I think, but, um, but, but clearly you know, something that, that we'll never forget and, um, and lots, of, lots of positive lessons to learn from the experience. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would say prior to the pandemic, um, you know, we're, we're neighbors also with uh, New York. So um, they kind of paved the way and taught us, you know, how to prepare for the, the pandemic as it came further north to New Haven. And prior to the pandemic, we had made um, great strides and success in our work-life well-being efforts in that we had been measuring uh, burnout since 2016. We had our annual wellness surveys. We had our clinician wellness council. We had a common language. We, the organization accepted this as an organizational responsibility, and we were all in it to, to do what we could for work-life well-being. We saw it as a priority and an organizational one. Um, we, when we first did our burnout surveys, we had people start to feel more comfortable to say, this is how I feel too, I feel burned out too. And when people started coming out of the woodwork to tell us that um, they, they feel these feelings, then the first thing we had to do, even though we knew we wanted to work on organizational drivers and uh, things like that, we knew we had to look out for one another. So the first thing that we really had to do when people started to feel comfortable about talking about how they felt is to make sure that we had that safety net under us first before we could 
um, then start working on the drivers. So we had been inventorying um, what resources we had available throughout the organization for quite some time. So when the pandemic hit, we had our whole inventory that we could immediately turn into the Care for the Caregivers website that we could say, we have all this, we're, we've got a safety net, we're ready. Um, so that was, uh, that was a real plus that we had had done that legwork um, prior to the pandemic. Uh, the other um, things is that we had a common language going into the pandemic that we could talk about orchestrating um, this job crafting and work-life balance and the things that we were um, feeling going through the pandemic as well as looking at the organizational structure and drivers and support. Um, making sure that people felt calm, control, and connected. And by control, we also had um, our communications group also put together the resources so that people had one place to go. What PPE do you wear under which circumstances? How do those change? Where are the um, spaces changing for taking care of patients um, with COVID and under isolation? The pandemic certainly brought up um, things that we all experienced and learned through the pandemic, and that is healthcare disparities in our community, those within our own workplace with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it brought up what it has been like for women in the workplace as they were not publishing as many papers, they weren't on as many grants, they were also working with childcare, what it means to be in healthcare and, and childcare and the support structures that you need for that. It broke down silos as we started to work closely with psychiatry and human resources and occupational health. It brought the organization together. We started talking about what does it mean wellness? What does it mean work-life well-being and uh, professional fulfillment? And what do those things mean as we started to come together to grapple with those things and work in a more orchestrated way with all of our partners? Nice. Those were good. Well, you're on a roll. Uh, we'll start with you for our next question. Uh, a lot of what you referred to, bringing people together, uh, attention to fairness in the workplace for women and others, uh, includes things like in inclusive leadership, uh, positive workplace relationships. Essentially, we want all of you to help us change the culture of medicine to create a culture of wellness. What's your high-level strategy for doing that? Uh, so high-level high strategy for people feeling seen, heard, valued, and developed, um, feeling engaged, empowered, belong and believe, feeling calm and in control and connected. Um, I think a lot of what we talk about uh, are, as those strategies start to come together in work-life well-being is leadership. Um, we talk a lot about leadership that's um, servant, transformational style leadership that means um, really knowing the intrinsic motivation of people, um, getting their buy-in, having two-way communication, um, kind of contingent on getting high, um, people with high stakes, complex decision-making, they need to have buy-in. Um, making sure teams, what it means to work as a team, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we're gonna talk about that later today with one of our sessions about teamwork and psychological safety and trust and, and how we hold each other accountable and keep each other motivated and have clear goals alignment. Um, we start looking into, we start training emotional intelligence and um, how we use that skill to check in with ourselves and each other and how to respond to one another more empathetically. Um, allyship with ouch oops training to make sure that we you start raising. Let's see what that is. So, um, our, our diversity, equity, and inclusion colleagues, um, they are teaching and we, through the wellness, also um, create conduit to make sure that we put this throughout the whole organization, is, is when someone ha says a microaggression, they don't, you assume best intent, um, but you notice it and it's something that might hurt somebody. And so anybody can say, that person or anybody can say, ouch. And it's known that, oh, a microaggression just came up. And they can just say, oops, because they didn't mean it. And we start to raise the awareness and uh, create that space. It can work for bullying. It can work for um, anything, diversity, equity, inclusion in the broadest sense. So we're really, um, I'm, I'm, I really encourage that when we have great colleagues who 
champion that work. Sounds good. And I want to hear from everybody on this. Changing the culture of medicine is a big job. I'd love to hear Jen's perspective and Kirk's and John's. Sure. So, I mean, that was a very comprehensive answer. I don't know how much more I can add, but I would say a uh, high level strategy for me um, has been engagement, making sure leadership, um, both executive leadership and um, physician leadership are engaged in this work. Um, that's been the, the biggest um, strategy. I think that's the most important and creating an infrastructure for, for this change. So once the leaders are engaged and involved, need to make sure that the work is including everyone. And the only way to do that is to have representation from all. For us, we have 40 hospitals and we're growing. So from all of those hospitals, from all of the departments, the divisions, to make sure when you're developing your strategies um, that everyone's opinion and, mm -hmm. and issues are being included in that. So I would say that those are the two high level strategies for me. Nice. Kirk. Yeah, I can build on that about representation. Um, our overall strategy is to have well-being represented at all decision-making tables. So we know, for example, let's say, it's a, let's say it's a clinical leadership meeting. We know that the quality and safety of patient care will be represented. We know that the patient experience will be represented. We know that finances and legal will be represented. And that group can easily make decisions without regard to the well-being of the organization or its individuals. So our job is to have representation at those tables. So sometimes finances is going to win. But at least we can say, if you do this, think about the effects on well-being. Yeah. Kirk, before we move on to John. What have you seen as, in terms of the effects of that when you have representation in the way you want? What kinds of things have you seen happen? Um, well, communications, for example. Um, we noticed that our organization was putting out messages, um, uh, sending messages in its headlines regarding all of the operational aspects. You know, here's what we're doing about this, here's what we're doing about that. And our economic recovery plan is this and that. And yet, it didn't say anything about acknowledging what the workforce was feeling, what they were undergoing. And by working together um, with the chief communications officer, as sanctioned by our executive leadership, we were able to balance the messaging so that people could know that their concerns were heard. Thanks. Nice, thank you. Sure. Yeah, no, these are all really great uh, comments that, that's uh, generating a lot of thoughts and, and, and memories of recent times. Uh, Mickey, I think it's interesting you said, what's your strategy for changing culture when many of us know that culture eats strategy for breakfast? <laughs> so um, I think it can be, as we know, culture is very hard to change, but that's, I think, what many of us are in the business of trying to do here, right? Mm -hmm. we, the, the current culture is not really supporting the workforce uh, and it's it's highly problematic um, I've really in the in the few years that I've been in this job I've, I've my recognition of the importance of a culture that promotes well-being has has just been on an upward trajectory and it hasn't stopped going up you know and and um, whereas you know I think other elements of system level change re remain critically important I've, I've um, recognized more the importance of culture and I, I think um, you know, the two main elements that we think about as it relates to trying to promote a culture of well-being um, really is about leadership and, um, and to Dr. Brower's point, uh, communications. Um, that, that, at least, is our current um, way in which we're prioritizing, strategizing efforts um, to, to promote a culture of well-being. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I think uh, there's a lot of evidence. Uh, Dr. Shanna Felton Swenson have published a lot of this, as, as have others in this room on uh, the importance of, of uh, leadership, uh, Dr. Derby as well, um, as it relates to, to the uh, impact um, on well-being. And so we're doubling down on that. I think we're uh, focused on trying to reach as many of the critical leaders as possible um, to make them aware of, of how their behavior impacts the well-being of the workforce. And we use that as an opportunity to 
do some of what Dr. Brower does to kind of make sure that we're elevate well-being as a priority so that when mm -hmm. they're thinking about all these other strategic priorities, they're including well-being. Um, we also have incre an increased sympathy for our leaders, particularly during this crisis, and have, um, have understood just how, how challenging and, and exhausted our leaders are. I've heard many, many stories, and you, I, I think you and Tate published on, on the connection between leadership, self-care, um, and, and the well-being of those who report to them. So, you know, I think we, we are also recognizing that if we're gonna, if we're gonna try to give them skills, uh, as it relates to their behaviors, we're also going to you know, do kind of a check on how they're doing uh, and make sure that we think about the, the well-being of the leaders, because uh, that's critically important. And then communications as well, I think, is really a, a central element of culture change. Um, and, and certainly, we had a similar experience, I think. Uh, and, and this was a, a key lesson learned during COVID. You know, there was a, certainly a period of time, this probably resonates with many of you, when uncertainty about what was coming was uh, was central to the to the stress of of the workforce. Just not knowing what's next uh, was the main driver at different periods of the pandemic. So the way in which we were able to identify what the information needs were of the community and then answer those needs with it, with with communications was critical. But it wasn't only the content; it was the tone. Uh, and we saw a we actually saw a demonstrable change in the tone and had a role in in that. Um, as it related to communications that went out, kind of validating and acknowledging what everyone's going through. Um, and even at times what I think we considered a win was being able to have you know, large emails or communications go out that acknowledge that you know, we, we may not have the answers right now because of the, of the pandemic. We may not be able to give you everything you need um, and, and sort of you know, acknowledging um, those deficiencies, uh, which is not typical behavior, I think, uh, of, of large healthcare system, um, or not, not typically seen in large healthcare system communication. So that's how we think. And I think those communications that you mentioned too, just make people feel valued that the, the effort and the time and the tone was changed. And I think a lot of what uh, these strategies are, are making you feel like you can belong and believe this is your organization. Um, you show up as you, you're valuable, and you have a lot to contribute, and we want to hear from you. We want your contributions to make this the best place ever. Some, sometimes with this change of paradigm in healthcare, people sometimes say they feel like a cog, and we certainly don't want anyone to feel that way. That's not thriving, and, and it, to feel like those you work with in healthcare on this awesome mission of showing up to take care of people. Um, you know, we're all part of this tribe, this community, mm -hmm. and the sense of belonging that we all feel um, and care for one another, I think, is really underlying a lot of that. Absolutely. And John reminded us that culture can eat strategy for breakfast, and that certainly can apply to strategy that aims to change culture. It's, it's, a, it's an aspirational goal, isn't it? and we need the right structure, the right support, the right buy-in. Jen, you and I have spoken about how the role of a wellness leader can change over time with shifting organizational priorities, shifting leadership. Given your experience over time, what advice would you give to organizations regarding what needs to be in place for ideal functioning of a chief wellness officer? Thanks, Mickey. So um, I think this goes back to Kirk's point. Um, I think to change culture and to be effective in this work, uh, the chief wellness officer or whomever is in that role needs to be at the table and needs to have the buy-in of the highest leadership of the organization. Um, and so when organizational leadership changes, there's a lot of unsteadiness with that. And you know whether the priorities of the organization change or, or don't change, I would say I've learned there's, there should be clear communication when there are those, those changes that are happening because um, a lot of us are, have very clear roles and um, very defined roles and very close relationships with the leaders um, in the organization, which I think really helps promote this works and work and makes it a, a safer work and environment. But as those leaders change, priorities of the organization change as well. So I, I do think this is a 
a reason or a call to have a structured chief wellness officer position and have the the role very clearly defined and mm -hmm. so I think that that would help when the leadership changes that role doesn't change and so when the, the organization is trying to find new footing with their new priorities the chief wellness officer and the importance of this work stays steady Absolutely. I hope that that's clear mm -hmm. nice and Kirk, I wonder as you think about your journey, you've been doing this for a while in various ways, officially as a chief wellness officer for a little bit too, uh, what might you add about lessons learned along the way? Um, before that, I, I want to comment on culture because I think some of us are old enough to remember that when attending physicians rounded in the hospital, they smoked. The nurses <laughs> smoked in the hospital, the patients smoked in their room, and that was culture, and we yeah. all accepted that as normal. Now look at what hospitals look like. Nobody smokes. Now that change took place over time, but it was in at least my lifetime that I saw culture change completely. And part of it was we had a Surgeon General at that time who really forcibly put out a report about smoking. And I'm really optimistic that we have a Surgeon General now who really believes in what we're doing mm -hmm. and um, will help us change the culture. Um, so the, the, the question, I'm, I'm not sure if this answers it, but, but I think one of the most important things that I've learned is that we can own, we need to own our own professional culture. Mm -hmm. So we are a very proud group and we go the extra mile to do what to take the best care of patients no matter what the cost is to ourselves. And I agree with the family of Lorna Breen, which is that culture played a role in her suicide mm -hmm. because our culture discourages people from seeking mental health treatment, right? Well, our culture is the cause of that, but because it's our culture, we can also solve that. I mean, EHR is a huge problem, but, you know, that, that involves working with EHR vendors, it involves knowledge about software engineering, all sorts of things that are outside of my realm. But my professional culture, our professional culture, that's ours. It's ours mm -hmm. to change. And so I feel pretty optimistic that we can, that we can do that. Um, I will add that I personally have had three courses of psychotherapy, long-term courses of psychotherapy as well as currently being on maintenance medication for depression. None of that has stopped me from having the career I wanted to have, it hasn't stopped me from being on the podium right now. And if my story can help other people, um, then that makes it all worth it. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, for, thank you for making it personal. You're absolutely right. We all do uh, contribute to our culture. We shape our culture and our culture shapes us. It's definitely a clear reciprocal relationship there. And uh, Tate has often said we each hold one share in the culture of medicine. And modeling, John brought up a, a, a paper showing how, as, that leaders modeling of wellness influences those they lead. That's certainly going to be true it, about leaders in wellness. So thank you for sharing a bit about how you deal with the, the stress of the job and other stressors that come your way. I'd love to hear from others on that front. Specifically, as you think about the stress physicians face, in part, we get in trouble because we're so passionate about what we do. It's so important to us that we can get out of balance. And it's probably true in, in some ways at times serving as a chief wellness officer as well. In what ways have you seen 
being a chief wellness officer threaten the balance that you need to make room for self-care and nurturing personal relationships? Mickey, let, let me ask, answer that question, but also build on, on Kirk's comments a little bit, um, because I think some of what's needed uh, in this role, in, in fact, can take a toll on, on the individual, and it builds on the point about culture change, uh, and I love the, the, you know, the example of, of smoking. You know, sometimes we talk about culture change as just being so hard to do, but it, it is happening. We are making it happen here. Um, the key, I think, to this role, this perseverance, grit, whatever term you want to use for it, um, you know, anybody who's a chief wellness officer now has, has really, um, you know, there's no, there's no chief wellness officer track. I, I was um, at a conference a few years ago, some of you will remember, know Daryl Kirch, um, who also speaks openly about his um, uh, dealings with, with his own personal mental health, by the way. And it was at a conference like that where he was speaking on that, where he's, you know, he was talking, and there were a number of students and residents in the, in the audience, and he said, well, maybe some of you will get on that chief wellness officer track like Dr. Rip and become chief wellness officer. And I remember looking at him thinking, I don't remember the, this track that you're speaking of and how we got there. Uh, you know, I just sort of kind of on a lark, you know, 15, 16 years ago, thought this might be something interesting to, to study. And, and, you know, he, here I am. And I, I'm sure that all of our journeys are, are similar. And, and so to create culture change, uh, it's critical to be perseverant and, um, and just, you know, make sure you're in the room. Um, I think a lot of the work of the job, and I promise I will get to your question, uh, Mickey, but a lot of the work of the job is, is really just building the relationships with the, the power brokers in any, given, um, in any given institution so that they get to know you and, and, um, and hopefully agree with what you're trying to, to promote so that it becomes inculcated in, in the culture. To get well-being to be a priority at the, at the table, like all the other priorities, requires, requires work. Now, that perseverance can take its toll, uh, I think. Um, and, and this is not an easy job. So, um, and largely be, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, including that, that need to stick to it for a while, but also because there will be times when you are looked to as the person to handle some um, immediate stressor, or uh, there'll be times where you know anything that that is affecting the impact of anyone's life is suddenly your um, you know your responsibility. And and we we all have our stories of things that are that are kind of comical in a way that have come to our to our desks around you know why can't you why can't you help me because my well being is being jeopardized. So you know there's a lot to to manage there and to push back and say what we do and what we don't do. I think I personally have always um, been uh, my my the way I've managed it. Uh, I think you were asking about sort of you know how you manage it is um, is I've always been a time management kind of person. Um, and for those who are psychologists or psychiatrists, you know you know there are certain personality traits associated with that. But that's kind of been my approach is sort of trying to be very organized with with the work and ensuring that there are other elements of my of my life that I integrate um, and that I try to, to derive meaning from what I'm doing when I'm doing it and that I try to ensure that I have time when I'm not working. Uh, and that's been, that's been harder to do since becoming a chief wellness officer because the work has, has creeped in um, more. But that's at least the strategy that I use and sometimes it works. <laughs> Um, I like that you mentioned the grit and perseverance because that definitely is required and it's also what you are managing for the long term uh, balancing um, your own well-being with that of serving others. Um, I think of resilience, a resilience framework for myself as a way of maximizing my own performance and to accomplishing my goals. And I do use those for myself. I mean, when, when you start, you have to know your why. If you don't believe in what you're doing, you can't have that grit mm -hmm. and perseverance. So sure. I feel very um, attached to my why and the work that I'm doing, and I'm committed to the work that I'm doing. Um, I have to often <clears throat> be self-aware of what's going on with me and how I'm feeling and how I'm processing that. 
I have to regulate my emotions. I have to think, why do I have them? I have to do the mind setting of rethinking of, um, am I being um, a friend to myself? I have to change those mindsets to growth mindset. I have to think of opportunities as an opportunity to learn and grow and stretch. Um, I, have, um, I have to find out my own limitations also in that you know, discovering that I think of self-sacrifice as a virtue, and I hurt myself with, with that, um, trying, to, trying to accomplish that why, and thinking that if I throw myself on the sword and I sacrifice myself and um, do all the statistics and make all the reports and then put off running or socializing or my hobbies or the things that you, you can't do that for years on end. You, you do have to remember um, what you do to rejuvenate and stay restored. You do have to remember that this body goes with you your whole life. You only get one. You have to remember that you have your family and your relationships that support you, sustain you, to say, I know you're going through, the, you got this stuff coming up, good luck. You can't neglect those because you need those people to call you like they did this morning to say, I wish we were there with you, good luck. Nice. Um, so I, I, practice, I practice resilience myself to go the distance and you, you can't sacrifice any part of it or you'll pay. <laughs> <laughs> we think we've all done that. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know that I've mastered that. So my husband would describe me as a type A plus personality. <laughs> and I think that's true. And so that combined with a passion and doing work that's under-resourced, I think, puts us all in a position where we're... Well, cardiologists don't work that hard. Right, I know. <laughs> Transition from cardiology to... Yeah, so I am a cardiologist by training and still practice. Um, but I, I have found over the years, to Christine's point, that you can't push yourself too hard because then you won't be effective. So, I mean, I have two kids and a wonderful family, and I spend, you know, always spend time with them, and I am a religious exerciser. And for me, that is, you know, I think everyone has to find what it is for them that helps them relieve their stress. And for me, it's spending a lot of time with my family and making sure I exercise almost every day to get that stress out. So that's what I do. Yeah, I, you know, this is interesting because we talk a lot about cultural change and um, improving the work. But there really is this individual level, and sometimes it's called resilience. And it is important, even though we sometimes say, well, you can't lead with that. And I think it's really good because we didn't lead with that up here. And, but when it comes down to taking care of yourself, that really is an individual level issue. For me, burnout comes and goes. There's been a couple of periods in my life where it's been sustained, and that was a different, that was a diff, those were different issues. But even now, I can feel burned out some days and not others. And when I reflect on it, I realize that in addition to all the strategies, and I use those, I use those too, I, I, have, a, I have top three. <laughs> one is sleep. And I'm just one of those people who can't get by on six or seven hours. I need eight or nine hours. And when I get less than that, like when I jet lagged yesterday, I was just totally out of it. The other one is meditation. Um, and the third one is exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and usually, if I'm like not feeling well or energized, I can look and say, oh, I'm only doing one of these now. Or, yeah, I'm doing two, and it's worked for a while, but I really need to add that third one. Mm -hmm. And so I think I agree with what everybody is saying, which is you got to know yourself. I mean, for me, it's meditation. It may not be meditation for you at all, right? For you, it might be listening to music or playing music. But you got to know what those things are, um, and you've got to make them part of your routine. Well, this is a great conversation. We want to allow the audience to pipe in with some questions, both online and here, for the last few minutes. Good morning. I'm Robert Ross. This is my first conference here. So 
trying to identify my role in the company that I just joined. I've been a physician for 40 years. And I have come across through the years, it's becoming more and more prevalent within our culture to use the term provider, <laughs> which is totally uh, undifferentiated term. My medical diploma, and probably all of you medical diplomas, says doctor of medicine. And in the company that I joined, many of the medical directors refer to their colleagues as providers. Many, we have an issue of dissatisfaction within our colleagues. And they feel disrespected. So I ask you if I am off base or if we need to start referring ourselves as physicians, as doctors. Yes, we work with advanced practice clinicians and that has created obviously an issue. So in my small group before we joined this larger group, we had the term clinician. And he was, I tried to enforce it. Because, so I would like to hear the panel or anybody else, how they feel about that. I, I can start. Um, I think language is very important. So I'm really glad that you brought this up. And I think people talked about, you know, having a common vocabulary. And I trained to be a physician and provider wasn't even a term in existence during medical school and residency. And I think it, I, well, I'm not gonna speculate on why it came into existence. But, but you know, but I think it, it had something to do with the corporatization and commodification of, of things. I like the, you know, so, and I like when, when our Surgeon General yesterday said, I'm a physician. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a physician. And other people in the room are not physicians. That's okay. And I, the term I, I prefer is that a physician is part of a broader group, healthcare professionals, because we're professionals. And the nurses are professionals. And the pharmacists are professional. And people who have licensed degrees are, are professionals. And so that's my answer. I'll let other people speak to that. Seems like everybody else satisfied with that answer. Kirk, okay. well, maybe we'll go to the, to the middle. Yes. Yeah, I'm Nigel Geerger. I'm the Chief Wellness Officer at Auctioner Health in New Orleans. It was remarkable hearing a lot of your stories about your strategy, strategy shifts pre and post pandemic, which I think many of us can relate to, uh, the power of authentic communication. I'd be interested in hearing, have you experienced scope change in terms of um, the, act, the activities of your office? In I can speak to that. Are, are you now the chief wellness officer for more people than you were uh, pre-pandemic? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, and yesterday we did a, a session on, uh, on the chief wellness officer job description where we sort of showed six different systems and the scope of the constituent groups, which vary considerably depending on how the role is um, is organized, and Dr. Shanafel will always tell you that you know you can kind of approach whatever size you want as long as you're resourced appropriately to take care of a group of that of that size. Um, what I will say is that that when a pandemic strikes, um, it kind of affects things a little differently. And all of us work in complex health systems, so whatever the confines around the group that we are working with. Uh, whatever that is, it oftentimes is hard not to do things that extend beyond it because of the nature of, of the way different health professions interact. That said, in COVID, I can say quite clearly where I sit within a school of medicine and my constituents were faculty, resident physicians, uh, medical students, and graduate students. Um, once the, the crisis hit and there, there was a recognition that this, the, the workforce was going to be really you know, stressed by this, these events, um, very quickly, we began to partner across the entire health system 
Uh, it led to a number of changes, some of which are durable, including the way we, uh, our new center that we have that, that provides uh, support uh, to the entire health system and actually take some of that off of my, my team. But the short, that's a long answer. The short answer is absolutely the crisis really um, made it that we couldn't, we could no longer just direct efforts to one group uh, if another group was left out. I would agree that's in, that's in flux because um, when you are, when you have a title chief wellness officer of a hospital, it, it connotes that you are responsible for the full scope of everyone at that hospital, though that's not how the original job description was um, written and you want to be that for everybody and you can't, you have the, you have the structures and the fund of knowledge to be able to do that so you can be a resource to all those other constituents while exactly like um, you were saying, John, is making sure that you have the resources before you stretch yourself further um, and to do what you can. Sounds good. Why don't we take a, yep, and John, you predicted this question. <laughs> Here it is. Yep. Uh, so how do, how do we work on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion for, and in health, for, its health, for healthcare workers? How many wellness officers have diverse backgrounds to reflect the workforce diversity to create the sense of belonging? Not seeing that discussed. So who, who would like yeah. to take that? Well, I guess if I predicted it, I probably should take it. It's a challenging <laughs> question for sure. Um, and, and I think the reason I predicted it is because we're, we're grappling with it. Um, uh, the short answer is there's not enough diversity amongst chief wellness officers. They, the, just like any leadership position where I think, you know, largely, um, health centers, you know, the, the demographics of the leadership team don't reflect the demographics of, of the population. And I think it's fair to say that's also the case amongst chief wellness officers, and we all got to work to change that um, so that that's not, that that's not the case, uh, so that, that the case is that, that the, our demographics represent our, our community. Um, one thing I would just add to that related to the earlier question is um, I, I personally have been going on, on a journey in, in this, um, a journey in which I've, I've needed to and, and have become and I'm continuing to learn uh, about just how important the intersection between uh, diversity issues and well-being, just that, how, how critical that intersection is. Um, and quite frankly, uh, if you're an individual that is experiencing uh, um, some stress to your well-being related, uh, related to a diversity issue, then that might be the sole driver or the primary driver that's, that's impacting you. And all these other things we're talking about that's, that's driving well-being uh, may, be, you know, may be important, but, but maybe of, of lesser importance. So it, it's critical that, that we partner closely um, that not only do we partner closely with our, with our diversity colleagues, but that we ourselves take up the charge, recognize the importance, and integrate it into our work. I can add to that. Um, I agree with, with everything that you're saying. When, when I look in the mirror, I see an old white male of privilege. And, and I think it's important for me to own that identity. Um, and because I have that identity, I have an obligation as John was saying, to educate myself um, about what other people did not have growing up and things that I assumed were of my own doing and I was rewarded for my own abilities and competencies or whatever have you um, existed within a, a structure in this country that ignores other people. I also th agree with you about the connection between well-being um, because we all want to be treated fairly, we all want to be included, we all want to belong. And unless everybody is in that boat, it's, it's like none of us are. Okay. I'd like to add to that as well, if I may. Um, I think a lot of what we do also is making sure that we make space for one another. A lot of the work that we're do, we do is to be more cognizant of each other and to make space for one another so that we all feel like we belong and believe here. I mean, we certainly work with our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, deans and, um, and colleagues and, and make space for them, you know, in our, in our sphere we make space to, 
for them to use that same platform also to do their work um, as they do for us and they are very um, wonderful uh, collaborators. Um, the other thing is I think you have to assess and you have to have um, very intentional interventions and you have to um, you, you have to mean it and, and, and do those, that work. And I think it's really important that people, we assess that people have equal opportunities to be retained, to get rewarded equally, and to advance um, based on their work. And I think that has to be measured, and I think there also needs to be ways to be sure that your processes for that are unbiased as much as possible. I'm certain Dr. Berliner has comments too, but why don't we go to our very last question since I think over here you've been standing for a while. Last question. Thanks, Vicki. Yeah, Tom Sanides from San Diego. One question is just how do you, um, your chief wellness officers, who reports to you and how do medical directors fit into your structure or department chairs or anybody else? I'm happy to answer that. Um, several people on my team are in the audience, so um, you know we're we're I couldn't do any of the work without without a group. Um, so you know every every chief wellness officer or organizational effort to address well-being is going to look a little different. There's going to be a host of, of variables that'll impact how that group is is resourced and organized. Ideally, that it matches what their charge is, right? If, you're, if, if there are fewer resources, uh, fewer folks reporting to you, then, then you, you should be clear and push back in terms of what's being asked of you so that it's commensurate with that. Um, in terms of, of medical directors uh, or, um, or department chairs, uh, uh, you know, as I was saying before, that's the work. The work is to engage with all of those leaders uh, to the extent that you can uh, so that you can you can push this agenda, which uh, you know is we, which we know is going to be to their benefit actually, and benefit the the, the system and our patients and, and so forth. So um, how do they fit in? Uh, they they fit in critically. I, in fact, uh, my schedule is often filled because there's all kinds of meetings with with uh, all of those individuals, which we have to be purposeful about arranging. Um, I'll I'll add to that. Um... You, you can't do this without a team. Um, some of our um, team is here for Clinician Wellness Council and make sure you don't miss their great presentations. Um, and, and they are we, are, we are making progress. They are represented by their departments and sections. Many of them have titles, many of them have dedicated time. Um, they report to their departments to be responsible for the well-being um, of their own departments, and we are all connected to our why. We've been committed for many years of everyone showing up. I think it's because they all believe in what they're doing, and together um, we are connected and we collaborate and we share those structures, just just as I do with other chief wellness officers. Um, so it's definitely been a tight, cohesive group of the willing and we're making progress. I would agree with that. Thanks for asking that question, Tom, because I think that's really important, actually. We have a very small team with you know, one person in, in my office besides me, and we are going through the strategic planning now about exactly this question. What should our team look like? It is all volunteer and you know, dedication-based at this point as far as the infrastructure of all the physicians and, you know, we're building coaching programs and we're asking those people to volunteer their time. And so we are rethinking all of this right now. And I think that's really important on an organizational level that you have a very clear team. And once your organization has had this culture change, I think it's time to have those conversations about the importance of setting up structure um, and that it's not volunteer work. Mm -hmm. I'll just say, in addition to people who report to us, you know, we have to have partnerships. None of us can do this alone with our own team. And so, yes, we partner with medical directors, we partner with chairs, and um, not just executive leadership, but people in charge of other aspects. Thank you. Well, this has been lots of fun. Out of respect for our next presenters, we'll hurry off, but thank you.